this is Lydia, the lifestyle coach, and I am super excited for our episode today. We have an incredible guest on, and what our mission is in the world is to end eating disorders using nothing but your brain, and it is so amazing to celebrate with the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people all over the world that after 20, 30, 40, 50 years of binge eating, bulimia, food obsession, body hate, like all of these different issues are now free. Not like they're successfully managing their eating disorder, but they don't have an eating disorder anymore because it is a problem that can be fixed. We know exactly how to do that. And it is so fun to see how people's lives open up and blossom and you get to truly be living when you're not under this captivity and in this prison anymore. And one of the most fun things that we do is get to celebrate all of the incredible people who have come through with that journey. And we have a lot of people that, you know, we help end their eating disorders and they go on with their lives and that's awesome. Um, and they just choose to take their freedom and enjoy life moving forward. And then we also have grads of our program who have a wonderful heart to help and share and to inspire. And that's what you see on our freedom stories for those who volunteer and say like, yeah, like I want to share my story if it can inspire someone else. And it's really fun to celebrate with them as well. And so I am mega excited today to have our guest on and um, we're doing something sort of fun that's like so a match with the times. If you're seeing this in the future, just know that this was filmed when the whole pandemic was happening with the coronavirus um, and we were all wearing masks. And what's really fun is that the incredible woman that we're talking to today, she she's a health professional and she's a very high profile, influential health professional um, that has a very big impact and a high profile presence. And so she has a fantastic journey that I'm excited to celebrate today, but she, because of her position, chose to be a bit more anonymous today. And so she's going to be wearing a mask, which is just great. It's just going to be like this fun cultural thing that we can look back and be like, oh yeah, I remember the mask time. And so I thought that was really fun. And I'm really excited for us to hear and learn and enjoy our incredible freedom story with Anne. So Anne, hello, and welcome to the show. It's so fun to see you here, and I'm super excited to celebrate with you. So why don't we just jump in and tell us a little bit about your origin story. Like, tell us how this eating disorder started, how it sort of evolved over the years, and why don't we start at the beginning? Okay, um, my origin story is um, I... I come from an immigrant background to the U.S. I moved when I was very young, and I grew up in Asian culture with a lot of uh, messages around discipline and purity and stoicism and success, and it was all very tied to conformity. And when we immigrated to the United States, we were a minority, very much in a in a Caucasian environment. So I always felt, I think, even as a little girl, as, as um, like I had to work hard and achieve and work twice as hard. So I, and I was also a very like astute observer of the cultural norms because I just wanted to fit in. And so I tied in my brain somehow success with um, being thin and being small and being sort of the fitting the image and the stigmatism a little bit of an Asian woman, you know, being excelling at certain things, but also having a lot of grit and, and, um, and even like a little bit of anti hedonism like I shouldn't have desires. I shouldn't have desires to eat. I'm over that, you know? And so when I got to high school, I was very, um, I was good in school. But I was also very um, disciplined. And also growing up, I um, wanted to mention that I had a lot of mixed messages around how I should be and whether I deserve to eat. Um, punishment in my household came in the form of like food withdrawal. There was a lot of, I think, um, tension around dinners and food. There was a lot of body shaming. Um, so I had a very tumultuous relationship with my mother. Um, and then in high school, I sort of 
found my own identity and I became an athlete of sort. Um, and I found my strength and my emotional and mental stability through um, being an athlete. And also I was in a sport where there were a lot of boys around me and I was always a bit of a tomboy. And, um, and I was going through puberty, becoming a woman and all of the other boys remained the same. And so they got to be, you know, the, the, they didn't have to deal with like the weight gain of being a woman and all of that. So that, that made it very difficult. And I just thought, okay, I'll go on a diet. It was very innocent. And also the restriction felt like I had control, control over my life and control over my body. And, um, and then also there was this cultural thing of like, when, um, when there were bulkier women that would come into the sport, um, people would be like, oh, she's a monster, you know, and to me, she was just thick with muscles. Um, and yet, you know, if, if the woman was like frail and thin like me, cause I was restricting, um, they were there, you know, we just never got to be as good as the guys. So there, I noticed this paradox in our culture, even in the athletic world of like, women have to be a certain size, but they still have to perform. So take that on. <laughs> um, I took on many of those like, cultural um, stig stigmatisms, I guess. And I went to college, went to graduate school, um, became um, into the med medical professional. I became a medical professional and um, I had a very, very success, or have a very successful career. And I deal with patients who are dying and, um, you know, in acute care settings every day and it was so easy for me to sort of put my own life aside because everybody else is dying around me and in the meanwhile i had um i had had binge and purge eating disorder since i was 17. so um, i tried to cover it up with a lot of um, athleticism um, i tried to cover it up with educational you know accomplishments uh, career accomplishments and yet you know this was one of those things I can I could visualize myself and like accomplish in many other areas of my life but I just couldn't fix this binge and purging um, behavior so it was it was like every day of a living hell of getting up in the morning and not knowing um, uh, not having control and it just really physically took a toll on me. I had osteopenia, I had amenorrhea, I had the female athletes triad, and I knew I would, I would lose weight to the point where I knew, um, even with all of my knowledge as a medical professional, that, um, that I was gonna die, that I, I became very thin, um, extremely thin, and I would hide under a lab coat um, and everybody else, even my patients would be like, you should gain some weight, <laughs> you know, and it just didn't click in my head. Um, yeah. so, and thank yeah. you so much for that. I want to pop in and bring awareness to some really important things that you're saying. And thank you so much for sharing your story. I just, I love the authenticity and the beauty of your story. And I'm just, I'm so thrilled for you on this side of it. I want to point out, I mean, like you were saying, Anne, there's all of these cultural messages that come to us, right? Of like, that it's about discipline, it's about self-control, it's about achievement, like how you can make your body be the less that you can listen to any sort of, you know, the human natural desires to eat or to be comforted or all of those things. Um, there's just this message for women, especially of control and success is your weight. And then, like you were saying, there's this pattern of we, we build all of these successes and these achievements because we, like with food, it just feels so impossible and it's getting worse and worse there. So it's like the harder we work, the bigger expectations we put on ourselves because we just keep on building up like, okay, well, I'm, you know, crazy. I'm failing around food. So I've just got to do my career better and I've got to do, you know, my achievements better. And 
just all of this stacking of these accomplishments. And yeah, like I, I hear you, like it's absolutely exhausting. And I think you brought up such a great point of we know so much, right? It's like, it's, it's not like we work with people that don't know that their eating disorder is hurting them. Like we work with a whole bunch of health professionals and psychiatrists and psychologists and you know, doctors and nutritionists and fitness people. It's like, you, you know this stuff but it doesn't stop you from actually being caught in this. So thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's so, so incredibly important. And, and tell us a little bit about like, what was that day-to-day bulimia like for you? Like, tell us a little bit about the experience of what it was like day in and day out with your eating disorder. Sure. Um, so I had a lot of restrictive thoughts. So every morning I would wake up and, and think, okay, I don't have to eat. I just have to work and go work and work and work at the hospital. And then, and I can restrict easily at the hospital um, because of all the cortisol and come back, come home. And I was doing things like yoga and running and exercising. And then um, at night, um, in the middle of the night, I just, um, I couldn't sleep because my complete, my body was just overworked and exhausted and I was so there was so much cortisol and then I would just eat everything there possibly could be in the fridge and I would have to purge I would have to grow up and I knew how bad that was for me and how lethal it was for me and yet I just couldn't stop and then that progressed into um, different parts of the day like um, even during breaks at work I would have to eat something every time I ate something I would have to fill up and it was like it was like I just had no control in my and I felt like I was in the grips of of you know it was like Jekyll and Hyde of some something that had taken over and I would have to do something um with the food and I just felt numb I couldn't have I couldn't feel anything um and partially because, you know, there's a lot of emotions up and down at work. Um, and I had to remain stable, um, or that's what I thought. But um, I certainly had um, through food and binging and purging. Um, so the emotional toll was extreme. And every night I, would, I, would, I wouldn't know if I could wake up the next day and do the same thing. And it was just overwhelming. Um, the amount of anxiety that I dealt with every single day. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, just the, that day to day, like I know that feeling of waking up in the morning and just feeling so completely out of control of your own life and not knowing how you're going to get through a day or have any say or control over your day and just feeling so in that grips and, and out of control. And thank you so much for sharing that. And, and would you, would you share a little bit about uh, like the physical impact, the physical impact that, you know, this had on you, but then I thought it would be just a wonderful opportunity because you're so educated in all of this. You are a very accomplished medical professional um, to also look at the perspective. If you would teach us a little bit about really how, how an eating disorder, how bulimia physically impacts you. So like your story, but then I would love to hear from your, your medical perspective, the impacts of what an eating disorder does. Sure. Um, so I'll relate it to myself because it's easiest. Um, I first started restricting and had my body percentage down to a certain place. And so I had amenorrhea. So that means I lost my period. I didn't have my normal cycle. And, um, and with that, the hormones just um, was completely out of balance. So I had some loss of hair. My bones um, started to deteriorate. So I had severe osteopenia. Um, I actually had lost all of my back teeth um, due to the, the hydrochloric acid from purging and, um, and also the osteopenia. So I had to have dental implants, but even then, you know, as a very young woman to have dental implants and then also know that you can't grow those bones um, properly like the dentist would want you to. And at a very young age um, is very devastating. Um, and to 
uh, I had a couple of bone scans, um, DEXA scans that told me that I uh, was osteopenic, so I was about to get on medications that a normal 70, 80 year old woman would have to get on. Um, I had severe anemia at some point. Um, I had, which is, um, you know, loss of blood, uh, red blood cells. And I, um, so I never got to give blood, you know, even though I was a healthcare professional, I would, they would always send me home with a raisin. Um, and just, I just physically hurt every night, um, every day, even though during the day I could numb that pain with other things. Um, every night I had sleep disturbances, I had anxiety, I had severe depression. Um, so that's the emotional side of it. But then also um, there are some serious, serious consequences, especially the bulimia, because um, you think you can just get away with it. That was part of what I thought because I've been doing it for so many years that it's benign. But in many ways, it's like riding a motorcycle. You know, you feel great and you're flying until you hit that one day and it could be the one that stops your heart. Um, so you can, um, the main effects of bulimia is that you can throw off your electrolytes, um, whether it's laxative use, whether it's vomiting, whether it's over-exercise. Um, and you can cause a heart arrhythmia and definitely go into ventricular arrhythmia and die um, at a very young age. Um, and, and then also just your your esophagus is full of um, blood vessels and it's a very fragile part of the body that really can't be fixed. So, um, so I, could, I could have ended up in an emergency room with throwing up blood and, and having a blister just, that just pops. Um, so it's, an, it's a medical emergency and at some point I knew that I had to stop everything or that's what I thought was I had to stop everything, stop my life and go into an inpatient treatment. Um, and pay tens and thousands of dollars to halt my life in order to get this fixed. Because, I mean, on one hand, I think um, if, if somebody were to come to me as, a, as me being a healthcare professional and, and tell me that they had bulimia or had anorexia or had binge eating disorder, I would say, you need help. You know, let's get you help. Um, this is a part of your life that you cannot ignore. Um, and on the flip side of that, I would say that the medical care, healthcare system for me failed me greatly because even though I'm a healthcare professional, I would go to another healthcare professional and A, I was so shamed by the societal stigma that I had, this, this eating disorder, that um, the, the one or two times that I tiptoed around it, around I was um, shunned, or I was told I didn't have it, or I was told I had anorexia, I was told to eat more, or um, or just to stop eating, or, you know, and it was like the worst advice that, that anyone could ever possibly give. Yeah. And so there, there was just no solution. And when you're really, really that desperate, and you're brave enough to go tell your doctor, your physician, who's supposed to know everything, and you're given a judgment, by them, you go back home with more shame. So um, I could go on and on about that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're bringing this up, Anne. I think this is incredibly important to examine because you know, the one thing is like, it, it is always so, so heartbreaking because we've helped so many people, but it's amazing to see how many really educated, intelligent people come to us that have been so scared and in so much shame, they've never done like a Google search to see what the real impacts are. And I know that I, I had totally been there. Like I remember after especially severe binges, I would, I would think like, I should look up and see if you can tear your stomach from eating too much, but I was just too scared to, I was too scared to in the moment and that I was too numbed afterwards to like on my high horse of like, well, I'm just never going to do it again. I'm going to diet even better tomorrow that then I wouldn't do it when I was feeling better. And then I was too scared when I was feeling worse. So it's amazing that a lot of people don't even know that there are at least three different ways that you can stop your heart anytime that you purge. And it's always so heartbreaking to hear things like, oh, well, I don't think that it would kill me. Like you said, it's like, you know, well, you can ride a motorcycle without a helmet and you're right, this, this ride, it might not kill you, but the position that you're putting yourself in 
is just so incredibly serious. And then we see that, as you know, so much, you know, people who are now, you know, they've, they've lost, I mean, months with their kids, they've gone to, you know, a treatment center where they've had to quit their job, they've had to be away from their families, they're in $60,000 of debt and told they're going to be back there every single year that they're broken. And they come back out of the medical model with having an even worse problem than they started with, plus all the shame, plus all this debt, plus feeling like a failure because they went to extremes and now it's worse than ever. And it's just, yeah, it's like we see women who have been five, seven times to the most extreme, you know, inpatient center and they're worse than ever. And so, yeah, I really, I appreciate that you're bringing that up because it is, it's a, it's a huge, a huge problem. So, Anne, like, I mean, with your experience or from a medical perspective, like, is there anything else that you wanted to share add about what that, what that experience was like for you to live for so long with an eating disorder? Yeah, um, just the contrast between, you know, I, I knew that I was taking care of people who couldn't help themselves. And I thought I could help myself, you know, with a eating disorder. But I was, it's that shame, internal shame that keeps building up. Like, I'm supposed to be able to help other people and I can't even help myself. And then, um, and then there were many, many things that I would tell myself, such as, um, oh, you know, once I have a baby, once I have a family, or once I'm a certain age, it's eating disorders or for young teenagers, you know, I should be over this, or I'll get over this. Um, they were um, also just going to a doctor and, and mentioning that and being a healthcare professional yourself, you know, they're, they're like, oh, you don't really have that problem. You know, it's okay or whatever. You, you, you're so smart. You can get over yourself. Um, but then like, and, and I knew I, I'm intelligent, but, and then also to feel so stupid <laughs> that I, I don't know how to fix myself, that I don't know how to, how to fix this problem. And I didn't even know, um, I just thought the solution was to live with it and live despite despite it, knowing that I have something every day that is killing me every day. And it's like I would never pick up smoking, um, but but also it's it's even worse, for, you know, because I it, I it's like food. Why is food killing me? You know, so it's just a horrible cycle. Yeah, absolutely, and. No, it's like this question of like, why am I killing myself with food? Like just being an intelligent person, like being an accomplished person, being able to help other people. And yeah, I know that awful feeling of like, but so why do I keep on believing this if I know that it's not true? Why do I keep on doing this if I know that it's hurting me? And yeah, Anne, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And may I ask for you, what was it that really had you draw that line in the sand and choose to reach out to get help? Like, what was it that really made you choose, especially, you know, once we were able to connect to, to get help, like to say, like, I'm done, I'm done with this. Like, what was it in you that, that helped you and supported you in that? Um, so I had a baby and it was a miracle because given that I had done all those things to myself, I think your body has an incredible power in your mind to heal. And I was able to get pregnant and I had a baby and it was about four months in and, um, and my doctor, uh, after I had the baby, I'm nursing and I'm, I'm in, you know, total bliss and gratitude that this, um, I was, being given and then now it's time to receive and and I still had um you know binging and purging uh almost every day um despite all of these life changes good or bad I just couldn't get out of the cycle that was the one constant in my life and I went to the doctor for my four-month checkup and she was like okay time to lose weight time to lose your weight from your pregnancy and I'm, I live in a country that that is a very um strict on women and looking a certain way and being a certain way um, in the culture, I think. Um, so she was like, you got to lose all that weight back to where you were, you know, essentially in my teenage years, which was very anorexic, um, to 
uh, otherwise, you know, you, you won't like essentially like <laughs> you're not doing the right thing. And I heard to hear it from another medical professional to hear that with authority. I, it just rang a bell in my head. I was like, no, it's over. This is, there's, there's something wrong with that message and I'm not losing weight. I'm a mother, you know, <laughs> I'm in a place where I know I can help myself. And so I somehow was able to step into power and, and say, I, I think that, you know, this, Lydia, you're, you know, your messaging with the two brains, um, there's something seriously wrong here and I don't have the solution. I, I can study all my life and I will never come to a solution. But, but the only way I think is to, to clear the slate, become completely humble and realize my defeat. Not all the other areas in my life um, because I've accomplished so much, but to focus and look at what is killing me right now. And then to see the stark contrast between how the, my baby, which is hope and future, and me, you know, wanting to live, to see that my daughter grow, that was, I think that was the precipice of, of me making that phone call to you. Yeah. And, and like, that's so incredibly beautiful. And also just, I, I really want to bring awareness to what you said of you are hearing from someone in a white coat with authority tell you, give you the advice that would have killed you, like that would have completely destroyed you. And this is, I want to really emphasize, this is a huge problem with the medical industry, is they are giving medical advice that gives people eating disorders, that makes their eating disorders worse that makes the problem harder and harder to fix. And I'm so grateful that you were educated and stepped into that strength and knowing that. And there are so many people in the world that don't know, that don't have the, like, the, the knowledge or that fire or that you know, history to hear that as the really bad advice that it is. And so I'm so grateful that you were able to hear that. And I'm so grateful that you found the solution and that we were able to connect and let's talk about freedom. And I'm so excited to celebrate with you. Okay, so Anne, tell us a little bit about what were some of, like once we started working together, what were some of those first like glimmers of hope of like, what, what were you able to do that you couldn't before? What were you able to feel and experience that you're like, oh, this is working? Gosh, it all, I would say, almost happened faster than I can realize. And so even now, after being graduated, I, there are so many things. I looked at my evidence journal, and there were so many things that I just couldn't do before. And it was now it's like, check, check, check. Um, and Freedom Story was one of them. I, I thought you had paid off all these ladies. <laughs> I was like, this is a scam. It's too good to be true. Why are these people happy? It is like the darkest, scariest, horrible disease. You know, like there's just so much shame. And, um, and it was just all of these judgments. Um, and so now in Freedom, I, I think the biggest part is I can eat whatever I want with my friends or with my family and it still takes me courage um, but I do the I do practice and and after a meal to be able to sit there like everybody else to be comfortable and I'm kind of looking around like wow <laughs> there's all these happy conversations going around with a full stomach you know and just just sit there and like soak up that moment of of pure joy, like like everybody else, you know, that I'd never been able to do before. There was just so much turmoil around like when to eat, how to eat, what to eat, and what to do after, and just like controlling and managing. And I have a lot of freedom around like, okay, well, we'll eat this. What whatever comes my way, I'll eat it and move on. <laughs> and that was so hard. So that was that's and moving on is such an awesome, <laughs> awesome thing. And and like, how long were you working with us before you started seeing a difference? Um, 
So it's always funny because I always thought I had to change my mind before I changed physically, but uh, what I'm doing. But before I knew it, it was like, it was like happening. And then I'm like, oh my God. So it was about four weeks um, yeah. right after the milestone three when I realized it was so profound that like I can actually visualize and act out something without acting out, you know, and, and, and keep the, the virtual reality side totally different from the physical side. Yeah. So just like within those three, four weeks, you're starting to see changes and like, you know, and I know that that wonderful place of hope of like, oh, like this is after so long of trying. Oh, this is actually working. Okay. So we're seeing this happen. So yeah. Tell us more about freedom. Like describe how things Uh, have changed. Like tell us about that. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't have to go to the grocery store and, and have like food items calling it my name, you know, <laughs> like, there's not like emotions around certain foods. Um, I can exercise without feeling like I'm tormented or like I'm punishing myself. Um, I think one of the biggest freedoms that I wanted to have was, was to feel safe in my body um, and in my own mind, I was like my biggest foe in my own head. And to have have a, have a conversation, like when I'm by myself, to myself, that's kind of friendly, <laughs> you know, that's kind of nice. To not have a civil war going on in my head is just, there's just so much peace around it. Um, I had so much anxiety. I've always been kind of like super active, hyperactive and jittery and have to do this, have to do that. Um, but I don't have that anymore. I, I feel very peaceful. I think that, and that's who I am. I feel like I'm discovering every day who I really was and am before I had my eating disorder and that person exists. (laughs) Um, there's just so, so much. And, and I also realized that I, and even more, I have so much time and energy and focus um, that I, I mean, I really thought I had like ADHD, like adult onset ADHD, but now I realized it was just the monkey on my back of this eating disorder that was just tormenting me all the time. And so now I, I don't have, you know, the sleep disturbances. I don't have like the jitteriness. I'm just present. And I can be, I realize every day that I can be extremely successful and powerful and a career woman and be in the medical field and be with my patients and not have an eating disorder. (laughs) That's profound. (laughs) Okay, so first of all, just celebrating you and and just we love you so much and it's been so wonderful to just see you get you back right and i want to address a couple of things that i know on the side of still having an eating disorder sometimes come up so one is like oh well if i didn't have my eating disorder i would lose my edge like i'm doing all this and that's sort of a thing fueling me or it's a thing allowing me to stay thin or it's a thing like that it's sort of like is this you know like cocaine, like it gives you so much energy and you feel like you, you need it even though it's killing you. Like sometimes we have that mentality. And so I want you guys to understand that not having an eating disorder, like your eating disorder was never an advantage to you. <laughs> like that is a complete lie that your eating disorder will tell you. It is so energetic and so freeing and you get so much more done when you don't have an eating disorder. That freedom is the true advantage. So that's one thing that I wanted to bring up. And then sometimes we have this idea of, oh, I've had my eating disorder for so long. Who would I be outside of it? Oh, well, maybe who I am, I wouldn't like. So here's what we can tell you. With the hundreds and hundreds of people that we have now set free of their eating disorders, never once have we heard somebody say, oh man, I liked myself so much better when I had an eating disorder. Like who I really am is just such a bummer. I was so much cool with my eating disorder. I just want to go back and be that person. Never. Everybody likes themselves better without an eating disorder. It's always like, oh, this is the real me. It's so amazing to discover that person. It's so peaceful. It's so wonderful. Because it's not just about, I know it starts out this way, but it's not just about oh, if I could just not be bulimic or if I could just not purge or if I could just not binge. 
that's like the tip of the iceberg. That's like, cool, let's do that. But the peace, the feeling safe in your body, the being able to have that kindness in your mind, to be able to sit still and be okay, to be able to be present in the moment, like that, that stuff is really, really fun as well. And so I just... Oh, I love that you're mentioning all of this. What else? What else are you celebrating about freedom? Um, I'm celebrating. I think I think I can take a lot of ownership around like there was a lot of tension around me, you know, um, and I'm, I can be very strict and rigid. And and I realized and also but that wasn't exactly who I am. I'm extremely patient and compassionate in my pace. And um, I'd realize now, looking back, how much my eating disorder had reverberated to people around me that I care about. You know, my family was tiptoeing around me during lunch, you know, or, or my coworkers. There was just something not right, you know, <laughs> about me. Um, and whether they noticed or not, it doesn't matter right now. <laughs> but, um, but I can tell a huge difference when I when I sit down and when I'm able to eat like everybody else and they're looking at me like, wow, you know, she's, she's like a loving, caring, normal part of human being, you know, and, and just the compassion that reverberates and the energy that I put out there really, really reverberates back. And so I just, I just wanted to mention like, I, it was so, I was so focused on myself and my managing my eating disorder that no matter how much I thought that I was caring for other people, no matter how much I loved other people, especially my family members, I had no idea how much that affected, you know, that I had been toxically sort of affecting my, the people surrounding me. So I'm really, really grateful. And, and I think it's really important for me to realize that. That's such a wonderful thing. And I know that that's something that a lot of times we'll tell ourselves is like, oh, you know, my, my kids don't know. Oh, you know, my partner has no idea. Oh, like nobody can tell. It's just my secret. And it's like, yeah, they know. <laughs> like they might not know that you specifically have an eating disorder or how serious it is. But yeah, it's like humans are humans. Like we know, we know when something is off. We know when somebody is just like hanging on day to day. And, you know, to see the opposite of that. I mean, and for you to get to, you know, be giving and receiving and to know that what you're, you're putting out of like that kindness and that patience and that, gr that gratitude, and then to be able to reflect that and have that come back to you. It's just such a wonderful thing, really at like a, a soul level. It's a wonderful thing to be free. And we're just celebrating with you so much. Anything else that is on your heart and that you wanted to share about the freedom and your experience? Yeah, I think it's just every day is a new possibility and, and I feel like the best is yet to come, you know, and, and in my deepest, darkest eating disorder days when I was, cr you know, crying on the floor every night and, and being completely powerless and helpful and, or helpless and, and, and knowing that my body was just betraying me, um, I now feel like um, the aches and pains have gone. Um, it does sound too good to be true, but it's true. Like I was holding on to so much energy, I think, with, with the eating disorder. And I was like clinging on to, to this and that. And now I just feel like a lot of energy clearing. And I had a lot of like random body aches that are gone. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for my body um, that I was able to heal. And then just to have hope for the future you know, to really, really, my, when I called, when, when I made that first call with you, my hope was like, was so small. And now it's, it's expanded, you know, to what else can the future bring? And, and it's ironic, because it's a coronavirus time where we're like, coming <laughs> constricted. But for me, we, even with like shelter in place and all of that, my, my goals and my dreams and my future with my daughter and, um, it's just the, the possibilities seem endless, you know, and I'm looking forward to that future. Yes, 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 yes. 
This is just so wonderful. And we are celebrating with you. Like that's what it's all about. Like to have a future that you can look forward to to be excited about life. And yeah, it's like, you know, it's incredible to have the relief of being out of crisis and to not have an eating disorder. Like that's awesome. But you're so right, Anne, about that. It, it just keeps on getting better. I know that, you know, like years and years and years later, like from, you know, being removed from my own eating disorder, there's still new layers of freedom. That's like, oh, wow. Like that, that's get, gets to happen. That gets to be something that we enjoy. You know, there are things that like a year and five years and 10 years are moved that like you appreciate in a whole new way. And it's just, it's a really beautiful thing. And I really want to congratulate you because, and what I know about you is that you have shown up so coachable. You have shown up coachable. You've shown up with an empty cup and willing to learn and willing to do the work and willing to see things in a different way. And I mean, it's been such a joy, such a joy to have you in our community and to coach you and, you know, with the coaches on our team, like it's just like, it's been a total, total joy because you are willing to just dive in, to dive in and, and get everything that was there for you to receive. And it's such a wonderful thing. And I just want to thank you for choosing your freedom. Like that always takes bravery. It always takes courage to step into the unknown and decide that you're drawing that line in the sand and you refuse to let this take any more of your life. But we always make that choice without knowing how it's going to be on the other side of it, with, without knowing really what freedom is going to be like, without knowing exactly how this is going to work. Because we know how to end eating disorders. Like we can tell you like, yeah, we can absolutely get you there. But until you experience it for yourself, you don't really know what that's like. And so it's always that step of courage that I just want to truly praise and applaud you in because it's such a wonderful thing. And in fact, oh, I think this would be fun to, to bring up before we wrap up. Um, and I know you were like super skeptical, <laughs> which I thought was just like amazing. So let's touch on that a little bit. Like what was it that came up for you before you were like in our community getting that freedom. I know that you would like watch freedom stories like this. Like tell us a little bit about what, what went through your mind before you were just like, okay, like we're, we're going to do this. It took me two years and I just wish it would take me two days, but I would hear these freedom stories and there was just a healthy amount of skepticism. Um, and that was my eating disorder brain that would point out everything. Oh, it's not scientific. It's not medical back. You know, it's like, it's, and my idea of like needing to fix this was like a brain transplant. <laughs> you know, I was like, I need to go back and go to a hospital and get a brain transplant, you know, like have IVs hooked up to me and, in just a, a lobotomy, which was what they used to do back in the days for an eating disorder, you know, and, um, and also like my, my skepticism was like, also, I, I, you know, I've had some therapy, but um, this was something that came from a traumatic background that had, you know, a perfect storm of all these things. And I, I thought that I had to fix every single one of those mental um, roadblocks in my life and revisit and re-experience and like do energy work and hypnosis or all of those things that are out there in order to like, get to a place where I'm ready to fix my eating disorder you know, because I, I thought I'd tried everything in, in many ways, in different ways. And then, and then also, I mean, even to the pursuit of being a healthcare professional, that was probably partially related to like, I wanted to figure out myself, you know, figure out why I have this eating disorder and why I'm the, the odd bird that, you know, the one in a million, you know, the, that have this eating disorder. Um, and I was like, this program just seems too good to be true. It cannot be, it must be a scam. It's a gimmick. You know, it's taking advantage of the vulnerable population or whatever. And so I had like, I just, I was, I kind of was like, forget it. I just don't know anything else to do. And I'm so desperate. I cannot live one more day like this. Um, so I might as well just make this call. And then, um, and then within that like first call, it was, it was, I, I did have a wake up call, you know, and 
and it was either this, it was very clear in that call, whether it was this or the rest of my life living um, away, trying to find other solutions. Um, and knowing that the worst solution, which was the only solution probably that I saw at that time was, was leaving my baby, leaving my work, leaving my beautiful career and life, all the things that are going on, I had to sacrifice that in order to fix myself. And that was, that was the most painful, heartbreaking thought, but that's what I thought I needed. Yeah. And thank you so much, so much for sharing that. And I mean, Anne, it's one of those things where it's like, and there are so many people that have done that so many times over. And I just want to, I just want to really emphasize for anyone listening that's looking for hope, like that when we think that it's this huge mountain to climb up, right? Like, you know, I have to do something, you know, like, you know, leaving everything that I've worked for and completely like, you know, leaving my life and my, my kids and my family and my accomplishments. So, cause I have to go to, you know, some other place and, you know, spend, you know, months there or, you know, this feeling of like, okay, well, you know, I have all of this traumatic background. So now I'm going to have to like, you know, dig up all of that. And like, it just feels so big and it feels so hard and just know that, even if you've tried everything, know that like, we know how to fix this. So it is a huge surprise to people that it is not nearly as hard as they thought that it was going to be. Like you said, Anne, like you're just like, oh, well, cause you're, you're smart, you're educated, right? You're just like, oh my gosh, it's going to, I'm going to have to overcome all this and all of this. And it's just like, yeah, but what if you don't, what if you can just fix your eating disorder and be done with it and then actually get to live and just again, I'm so proud of you for choosing that freedom and being, being open to seeing it another way, being willing to ask the question of like, what if, what if I could just stay with my baby and with my career and be able to get the help that I need from the comfort of my own home? Like, yes, yes, yes. Ah. <laughs> uh. So wonderful and just celebrating with you and just so, so thrilled for you. And anything else on your mind that you wanted to share, Anne, or do you feel like our conversation is complete? Um, yeah, just, uh, I always thought, man, if there was like some medication that I can take to fix this problem, that I would take whatever it is, you know, that magic pill. And I think through the program, I, I know that I had it in me all along, you know, that, that wisdom was like the medicine that I was born with, you know, and that, and to sort of unlock that medicine <laughs> and you helping me do that. Um, I really needed, I really needed that. So I'm, I'm so, so grateful for you and the community of courageous women that I got to go through the program with. Um, and they, they, they are like, women from all walks of life, extremely successful, extremely well-educated, um, and, you know, college students with, with incredible wisdom and, and expertise, and um, everybody just has their own um, uniqueness that they bring, and that, and they teach me every day, and so I think you have an incredible community, um, and I, I, trust all of that and to get all of that energy to help me with my eating disorder was was such a great great um experience so i thank you for that oh thank you and we receive that and we just have absolutely loved this journey with you and it just it, it, the fun continues like this is the gift that keeps on giving and the party that keeps on going and i know that we have such a good time and it's just wonderful to have you part of this incredible tribe and this growing tribe. And you're right. I mean, this is women all over the world, of all walks of life, of all different backgrounds, of all different ages. Um, I think probably the last year, we I know that we had a 19-year-old graduate and we had a 77-year-old graduate. <laughs> just like, yes, 
an, an amazing women get eating disorders and men like it's just like oh these are these are really cool people and so it is so fun to have our community just being able to enjoy freedom together and love you so much Anne. thank you for sharing your story thank you for being who you are I am so grateful that your baby gets you. I'm so grateful that your family gets you. I'm so grateful that all of your incredible patients get you. Like the world needs strong women like you. And I'm so grateful that your eating disorder is not taking you away from the world anymore because it is so much better with you in it and just sending all, all the love. Thank you. All right, you guys. So amazing celebrating with Anne today. And this is Lydia, the lifestyle coach and Anne. And if you guys, um, you know, want to take this same path, we actually have a free session that you can do with one of our coaches. Um, it's called a breakthrough session. And on that session, that's the exact way that Anne started is you can just, you know, pop over to lifewithlydia.com slash apply. Again, that's lifewithlydia.com slash apply. And you can snag a spot there. And that's going to be where we will be fully present for you for an hour and take you through a really powerful process um, called a breakthrough session, where we're going to get super clear on what's happening. And if we can get you to the other side of this in freedom, we will show you how, or if not, we'll know where to best direct you from there. But this is about you. And this is about taking that individual time. And then we will make sure that you are super clear on next steps to solve this. And that is a service that we give to the world so that we can really truly free people from their eating disorders. And again, that's called a breakthrough session. You can just go to lifewithlydia.com slash apply. And this is Anne and Lydia, the lifestyle coach and signing off. Bye guys. Hi, this is Lydia, the lifestyle coach. And after helping hundreds of people move from food prison to food freedom using only their brains, I am confident that anyone can be free who wants. If you would like a free session with our team, you can go to LydiaLifestyle.com. Would love to see you there.